I would like us to pray as we enter into this last presentation, which is our first allegiance, and see what the Lord has for us. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, thank you for the blessings of the Sabbath. And thank you for taking us through all the week, Lord. And now that we are in the Sabbath, and even in the final day of the week, we praise your name. That which has not been revealed unto us, Lord, and it is needful for such a time as this, reveal it unto us that uh, we may be able to comprehend what uh, we are called to be and to do at this time. We need your blessings in this day, even the double portion of your blessings, not only of the physical restoration, but the spiritual restoration as we approach the throne of grace. And so speak to us in thy tenderest voice. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And so uh, I just want to reiterate that uh, the Lord has been good. And uh, I want to thank the uh, Gospel Sounders team for making this to be able to happen and uh, giving me an opportunity to be able to present uh, on the last generation theology. Actually, we cannot say that we have done uh, a great service to the topic. Uh, we have still uh, a lot of information to cover. And uh, uh, my main work is was to lay ground so that uh, uh, people may go and uh, see what the Lord is speaking to them and be able to build upon uh, that. And so, as I have said, the Lord has been good. The Lord has been uh, uh, gracious in every way. And uh, I want to presume that uh, we have been blessed. And uh, if uh, you have not been able to follow the presentations here, then you can go on our YouTube channel and be able to um, uh, be able to uh, look onto the other presentations. Otherwise, our topic right now is um, our first allegiance. As a people who are living in such a time as this, what does God expect of us and who are we to give our allegiance? Who are we to uh, give allegiance? But before I delve fully into this, uh, I want us to share something, the experience that will bring God's, uh, bring God's people the seal of God. In the book of um, Zechariah, uh, chapter, the book of Zechariah, and uh, uh, I'll be there in a moment. Zechariah. Uh, in the book of Zechariah chapter 3, there, there is something that we find, Zechariah's vision of Joshua and the angel, uh, we are told that it applies with a peculiar force to the experience of God's people in the closing up of the great day of atonement. And you can find that in uh, Testimonies of the Church, volume 5, page 472 to 475. But uh, what is this vision all about? the book of uh, Zechariah, uh, chapter 3. And he showed me Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord, and Satan standing at his right hand to resist him. And the Lord said unto Satan, The Lord rebuke thee, O Satan, even the Lord that has chosen Jerusalem rebuke thee. Is not this a brand plucked out of the fire? Now Joshua was clothed with filthy garments and stood before the angel. And he answered and spake unto those that stood before him, saying, Take away the filthy garments from him. And unto him he said, Behold, I have caused thine iniquity to pass from thee, and I'll clothe thee with the change of raiment. And I said, Let them set a fair mitre upon his head, so they set a fair mite upon his head and clothed him with garments, and the angel of the Lord stood by. And the angel of the Lord protested unto Joshua, saying, 
Thus said the Lord of hosts, if thou will walk in my ways, and if thou will keep my child, then thou shalt also judge my house, and shalt also keep my courts, and I'll give thee places to walk among these that stand by, which are the angels. Hear now, O Joshua, the high priest, thou art, thou and thy fellows that uh, sit before thee. For they are men wandered at, for behold, I'll bring forth my servant the branch. For behold, the stone that I have laid before Joshua, upon one stone shall be seven eyes. Behold, I'll engrave the graving thereof, said the Lord of hosts, and I'll remove the iniquity uh, of that land in one day. In that day, said the Lord of hosts, shall he call every man his neighbor under the vine, under the fig tree. And so we are finding that um, the experience of uh, Joshua the priest in the book of Zechariah chapter four, we are told that this experience, um, we are told that the Zechariah, Zechariah's vision of Joshua and the angel applies with um, peculiar force to the experience of God's people in the closing up of the great day of uh, atonement. And so we can be sure that um, actually, uh, the experience that he passed through is the same experience that the people of God will be able to pass through. And welcome those who are joining us. We are just starting uh, on uh, live on Facebook and uh, on Zoom. And we are looking at our first allegiance. But then we are told that um, Zechariah's vision in Zechariah chapter 4 Actual Zechariah vision of Joshua in Zechariah chapter 3 applies to the people of God during the closing uh, period of the great day of atonement. And so we want to see this experience and what uh, whose allegiance, whose side we shall be. Uh, the topic is our first allegiance. Now, as Joshua was pleading before the angels of the remnant church, with brokenness of heart and honest faith, will plead for pardon and deliverance through. Jesus, their advocate, in that uh, they are fully conscious of the sinfulness of their lives, they see their weakness and unworthiness, and as they look upon themselves, they are ready to despair. They don't see anything good in them. If the grace of God and the gift of salvation cannot take them beyond the pearly gates, then nothing else can get them there because they have nothing to present uh, uh, before God as um, uh, 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 qualifying for their uh, redemption. In fact, um, this reminds me on, of one thing that um, uh, uh, I hadn't put in my thoughts uh, uh, during uh, the, the preparation of this uh, um, uh, topic, uh, First religion, And this is found... Um, uh, uh, I'd like to, you to see it is found in the in uh, 1888 materials, page uh, 816, paragraph one. Today uh, uh, is a good day because the Lord will want us to understand some things so that. Uh, we may not go about bragging that uh, we can do this and that uh, as, as meriting our salvation. Actually, uh, we haven't looked fully into the issue of justification by faith, that, but I'm just touching some few things here and there on justification. In 1888 messages, page um, 816, paragraph one, I ask, how can I present this matter as it is? The Lord Jesus imparts all the powers all the grace, all the penitence, all the inclination, all the pardon of sins in presenting his righteousness for man to grasp by living faith, which is also the gift of God. If you will gather together everything that is good and holy and noble and lovely in man, and then present the subject to the angels of God as acting a part in the salvation of the human soul or in merit, the proposition will be rejected as treason. Standing in the presence of their creator and looking upon the unsurpassed glory which enshrouds his person, 
they are looking upon the lamb of god which was which uh the lamb of god given from the foundation of the world to a life of humiliation to be rejected of sinful men to be despised to be crucified who can measure the infinite of the sacrifice and so we are presented with the story of Joshua before the angels and what does Joshua have to give for him to be accepted before the Lord it is only the Lord who rebukes the devil for Joshua and clothes Joshua with a mite upon his head and tells him I have caused the iniquity to pass but while the Lord is doing this we see that Satan is covering Joshua with filthy garments and then the Lord asks uh, Satan is this not a brand plucked out of fire? Have this not been a uh, suffering affliction and not from me but, me, but from you, Satan? As even you moved me against Job, so you have moved me against my people and they have passed through a time of trouble uh, or through the taste of the image and the mark of the beast. And don't you see this uh, like a brand plucked out of fire? What is it that you have against them? They are mine, the Lord declares. And so we are going to see this experience repeated in God's people. But remember one thing, a Satan was accusing Joshua before the Lord. Joshua was standing before the Lord and he was supplicating and praying for his salvation. He was not going about sinning and expecting the grace of God to declare him justified because there is nothing that he can present before the Lord as meriting his salvation. No, Joshua actually stood before the Lord and what was he doing? He was confessing his sins and he was praying and the Lord says, behold, I'll send my servant the branch. Now, what is the connection there? That when as Joshua looks at himself, he sees himself unworthy and he wonders who can be able to stand for him. And then the Lord says, you know what? It is not by might or it's not by power. I'm going to send my servant the branch. And what will he do? He will die for you and cleanse you of all the iniquities. And thy accuser will have nothing against you because I'll make your sins, your iniquities, past and does just the lord make the sins pass like that even when people are continually uh, uh exercising non-sin no we are told in uh, uh hebrews chapter 10 verse 26 if we continue sinning after we have known the truth there remaineth no sacrifice for our sin but to wait for that fearful judgment and so we can be sure that the lord will make our sins pass as we uh, uh appear before him and entreat him to pardon our iniquities and to accept him by his gift and not by our works. This experience of Yeshua has to be repeated in the end time as the people of God afflict their souls before him, pleading for the purity of the heart, the command is given, take away the filthy garments from them and the encouraging words are spoken. Behold, I have caused thine iniquity to pass from thee, and I'll clothe thee with the change of raiment. But this affliction of soul actually comes in the last days of the great day of atonement. We read it in uh, Leviticus chapter 23 that uh, the requirements that were needed on the day of atonement is to afflict the soul and to offer an offering by band uh, an offering uh, a band offering by fire and then uh, to do no survey work and so you can be sure that as Joshua is appearing before the lord representing the last generation he is afflicting himself and then he is in the sanctuary gathered around the sanctuary and you can find that Joshua is in the very presence of god and then one thing also that he is not doing any survival work. He is not doing any common job. In the day of atonement also, there is no doing any common job that is not uh, really, uh, uh, it's not uh, connected to the third angel's message that reproduces the character of God that is needed in his people in the last days. And so uh, this 
spotless robe of Christ's righteousness is placed upon the tried, tempted, yet faithful children of God. And even though Satan will continue pointing his fingers at them the way he pointed at Moses. Remember, the scenario in uh, Zechariah chapter 3 is the same scenario in the book of Jude. When Jesus wanted to resurrect uh, Moses, we are told that Satan came there to contend for the body of Moses. And why? Because Moses had been commanded, go speak to the rock and give the water to the Israelites. And in his anger, he went and smote the rock and said, shall I give you water, ye rebels? Now, what, what, why was that so bad? It is because actually God had to smite the rock only once and Moses had previously smitten the rock. And so Jesus Christ didn't have to die twice because he is the rock of ages. He is that rock of offense. He is the stone that the builders rejected, but now has been made the chief cornerstone. But now Moses actually destroyed the symbolism of Christ dying once on Calvary and smote the rock twice. And then the Lord was wrought with him because of the provocation of the children of Israel. And this really tells us one thing. Let us never act because of provocation, because the Lord will all only judge us guilty. But then the story of uh, Moses, actually, he confesses his sins and he's forgiven, and then he dies, and then Christ goes to resurrect him, and the devil has something against him. And Jesus Christ tells the devil, the Lord rebuke thee. The Lord rebuke thee. And so the same words are spoken of Joshua in Zechariah chapter 3, the Lord rebuke thee. And it is in the day of atonement when the children of God are gathered around the sanctuary, they are afflicting themselves and they are not doing any survival work. They are trying to uh, make sure that they are on the side of the Lord. And then the devil comes and points fingers at them and says, look at the people who are you are saying they are your own but the Lord will rebuke him. The despised remnant are clothed in a glorious apparel, never more to be defiled by the corruptions of the world. And their names are retained in the Lamb's book of life, enrolled among the faithful of all ages. They have resisted the wiles of the deceiver. They have not been turned from the loyalty by the dragon's roar. They have faced the image of the beast, the mark of the beast, and they have been wearied, hunger has followed them, coldness and harsh weather, and everything are comparting with the wild animals while fleeing from their enemies. And still the devil points at them, and then the Lord says, no, that is not the situation. Although you move me against my servant Job, yet he has done nothing wrong. And this is what will be pronounced upon the last generation. Now they are eternally secure from the tempter's devices. Holy angels unseen were passing to and fro, placing upon them the seal of God. So we are told in uh, Testimonies to the Church, volume 5, page 472, that uh, the angels of God shall be ascending and descending upon them. And for what reason? Because they have been beholding this plan of redemption. And Peter says that um, they are, uh, the desire to look into these things. And their yoke of allegiance is to God and for what purpose? To bring salvation to the afflicted souls before the Lord. And so the story of the Joshua, although primarily uh, we see only Joshua in uh, Zechariah chapter three, actually it depicts the anti-typical day of atonement and God's people afflict their souls as Joshua was afflict, afflicting his souls. And what is done, done is Christ says, take away their filthy garments and seals his people. In Prophets and Kings, page 725, I want us to turn there if uh, you are following. Um, there is um, Prophets and Kings, page 725. Clad in the armor of Christ's righteousness, not filthy garments, 
the church is to enter upon her final conflict. Fair as the moon, clear as the sun, and terrible as an army with banners, she is to go forth into all the world, conquering and to conquer. And um, this, uh, this, this, this same sentiments are found in the in uh, Song of Songs. Allow me to go to Song of Songs. Is it uh, chapter five? Song of Songs. Song of Solomon or Song of Songs. Uh, chapter six. And I'll start from verse eight. Chapter six and from verse eight. There are three score queens. There are three score queens and four score concubines and virgins without number. My dove, my undefiled is but one. There are so many churches professing to be the church of God. But we are being told that my dove, my undefiled is but one. She is the only one of her mother. She is the choice one of her that bear her. The daughter saw her and blessed her. Yeah, the queens and the concubine, and they praised her. Who is she that looketh forth as the morning, fair as the moon, clear as the sun, and terrible as an army with banners? The answer is, this is the last generation where actually it is a generation that their filthy garments are taken away and white robes are given unto them. They shall be the pillars in the temple of God and they shall never go out. They shall serve in the temple of God continually. And uh, we are told that uh, the scenario in the end time is of weeping, praying in agony of spirit. And the guardian angels will put their wings around those destitute uh, uh, generation living in the end time, and uh, they shall act in one accord. We shall have an upper room experience, and all our differences, these battles of supremacy, these battles of who is who in the ministries and in the churches will pass away. You remember the disciples in their infancy, when Christ was training them for three and a half years, James and John comes before Jesus Christ and their mother, and the mother asks, please grant one of my son to sit on the right and the one on the left. And Christ tells them, it is not in my permission to say who shall sit on my right or on the left, but those things are left unto my fathers. Nevertheless, when the 12 tribes, when now you shall be seated in the kingdom, you shall sit on the throne judging the 12 tribes of Israel. But it is only after they had conquered the self in them. The greatest battle to be ever waged, we are told, is the battle against self. And uh, I'll repeat to read this in your, uh, in your present. This is uh, Steps to Christ. Uh, Steps to Christ, page uh, 43. Paragraph 2, AC 43, paragraph uh, 2. But then I'll start a little bit earlier as I go to paragraph 3, and it talks about consecration. God promise is, ye shall seek me and find me. When ye shall search for me with all your heart. This is the scenario of the day of atonement where actually people are afflicting their soul. The whole heart must be yielded to God or the change can never be wrought in us by which we are to be restored to his likeness. By nature, we are alienated from God. The Holy Spirit describes our condition in such a words as this, dead in trespasses and sins. The whole head is sick and the whole heart pain, no soundness in it. We are held fast in the snare of Satan, taken captive by him at his will, Ephesians 2, 1, Isaiah 1, 5, and 6, 2 Timothy 2, 26, are the scriptures he is quoting. God desires to heal us, to set us free. But since this requires an entire transformation, a renewing of our whole nature, 
we must yield ourselves wholly to God. And then comes the quote, the warfare against self is the greatest battle that was ever fought. The yielding of self, surrendering all to the will of God requires a struggle, but the soul must submit to God before it can be renewed in holiness. And so the day of atonement is, I can say it is not only the day of Yom Kippur at one man, but it is a day of battle. People think it's a day of peace. It is a day of battle, a battle against self. In order to obtain victory, we must come before the Lord, not doubting that he will do what he has promised to do, but actually asking for the latter rain to be able to withstand the affliction before us. And our hearts have to be submitted to God to be renewed unto holiness so that uh, we may receive the latter rain and be able to be of the company that will sound the loud cry. And so the remnant have to be clothed with the robe of righteousness and then the remnant have to receive the latter rain to be able to proclaim the loud cry. No one is going to proclaim the loud cry while he is still having filthy garments. And uh, 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 allow me to read again. Uh, this is last day events, page 179, paragraph two. We are told the great issue so near at hand and postman of Sunday laws will weed out those whom God has not appointed and he will have a pure, true, sanctified ministry prepared for the latter rain. And the question that I have to ask ourselves, are we putting ourselves in position that the Lord would like us to uh, put ourselves in? Are we aligning ourselves with Jesus Christ or are we aligning ourselves with the enemy? Not one of us will ever receive the seal of God while our characters have one spot or stain upon them. And so it is left unto us to remedy the de defects in our characters, to cleanse the soul temple of every defilement, then the latter rain will fall upon us. We are told that, um, uh, uh, is this uh, 90, page 79? Uh, I'll try to look at this 90, page 79. I hope that uh, I get it, that um, 90, page 79, sorry. We must reflect fully the image of God. Uh, this is um, from 90. Uh, sorry for that. If we will be protected against the beast, if we shall be protected against the beast, um, we must... Um, reflect the image of God fully. And so the time of test is coming uh, before us. And how shall we be able to stand before uh, the Lord? How shall we be able to stand before the Lord? And so we must remedy the defect in our character. We must uh, uh, be clothed fully in Christ's righteousness and nothing else. We must uh, be closed in Christ's righteousness and uh, nothing less if uh, we will be able to... Uh... Now, I I I'll find this quote. It is uh, in uh, early writing page 71, sorry. Early writing page 71, paragraph 1. I also th saw that many do not realize what they must be in order to live in the sight of the Lord without a high priest in the sanctuary through the time of trouble. Those who receive the seal of the living God and are protected in the time of trouble must reflect the image of Jesus fully. I'll write in Page 71, paragraph one. And then she goes ahead and say, I saw that many were neglecting the preparation so needful 
and were looking to the time of refreshing and the latter rain to pit them to stand in the day of the Lord and to live in his sight. Oh, how many I saw in the time of trouble without a shelter. They had neglected the needful preparation. Therefore, they could not receive the refreshing that all must have to feed them to live in the sight of a holy God. Those who refused to be healed by the prophets and failed to purify their souls in obeying the whole truth and who are willing to believe that their condition is far better than it really is will come up to the time of the falling of the plagues and then see that they needed to be healed and squared for the building. But there will be no time then to do it and no mediator to plead their cause before the Father. Before this time, the awful solemn declaration has gone forth he that is unjust, let him be unjust still, and he which is filthy, let him be filthy still, and he that is righteous, let him be righteous still, and he that is holy, let him be holy still. I saw that none could share the refreshing unless they obtained the victory over every besetment, over pride, selfishness, love of the world, and over every wrong word and action. We should therefore be drawing nearer and nearer to the Lord and be honestly seeking that preparation necessary to enable us to stand in the battle in the day of the Lord. Let all remember that God is holy and that none but holy beings can ever dwell in his presence. Now, what is the problem with the church right now? Uh, what is the problem with the church right now? Great controversy, page um, six. 102, 601 paragraph, 601 paragraph two. Many are deceived as to their true condition before God. They congratulate themselves upon the wrong acts which they do not commit and forget to enumerate the good and noble deeds which God requires of them, but which they have neglected to perform. It is not enough that there are trees in the garden of God they are to under his expectation by bearing fruit. And so the problem has been with us, the problem that has been with us is congratulating ourselves for the things that we do not do, forgetting to do the things that we should be doing. And so we must come to a point that every defect in our character is remedied. Our filthy garments must be removed, we must receive the seal of God or the approval of God or the Holy Spirit, then we can be able to participate the, uh, in the loud cry. And so, especially in the closing work for the church, in the sealing time of the 144,000 who are to stand without fault before the throne of God, will they, the true people of God, feel most deeply the wrongs of God's professed people, that um, although they can even have an assurance that their sins are forgiven, but then they will be like Daniel in Daniel chapter 9, where although he had not sinned against God, but he included himself corporately with Israel. You know, sometimes we become so selfish. We think that because we have not sinned against God, by being amongst the sinful people, we are okay. I wish I had presented the issue of uh, 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 the experience of Isaiah. Isaiah had not done any sin, and he was a prophet of the Lord. But then when he came to view the holiness of the Lord, Isaiah exclaimed, I'm undone. I'm a man of unclean lips, and I live amongst unclean people. That will be the experience of God's people. Although they have no sense of any iniquity or sin, they have not confessed. Yet even the sins of the, the, the corporate church of God, the whole Christendom, is over their shoulders and they are crying because they have died to self and they wish to see everyone in heaven. And seeing iniquity abound where they are, they shall be afflicted so for the wickedness that shall be going there. And so uh, the anguish of the whole church of God shall be upon them and they shall not be just confessing how they have been reluctant to do the work of God, but they, they will confess even the sinfulness of other people, how they are even uh, are dull of hearing of the word of God. And so 
one man is recorded in the Bible, and uh, I'll go to the book of Peter and show you that his experience also is the experience of um, God's people. Um, that is Lord. In the book of uh, Second Peter chapter two, look at this. Second Peter chapter two. And this is talking about the punishment of Sodom and Gomorrah. For if God spared, for if God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell and delivered them into the chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment, and spared not the old world, but saved no, the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly, and turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them with an overthrow, making them an ensemble unto those that after should live ungodly and delivered just Lord vexed with the filthy conversation of the wicked. Now look at verse eight. For that righteous man dwelling among them in seeing and hearing vexed his righteous soul from the day to day with their <coughs> unlawful deeds. This is the experience of the children of God in the last days. Even though they can be told, okay, you are going to heaven, your name has been sealed. But the fact that they live amongst a people who are practicing wickedness, and yet they would gladly want to see them in heaven, their souls shall be afflicted. And so there is nothing like saying that uh, the righteous shall have a comfortable time when actually they are living in the end time. Although their sins will not bring a punishment upon them because they have been forgiven, but the anguish of the soul of what others are involved in shall deeply uh, uh, afflict their soul. And so those who receive the pure mark of truth wrought in them by the power of the Holy Ghost represented by the mark of the man uh, in linen in Ezekiel chapter 9, they sigh and cry for the abomination that be done in church. Since when did you ever cry for what is happening in the church? At the time when danger threatens the church. In fact, we are told that the reason why God sends the third angel's message, it is because the whole church is in danger of receiving the mark of the beast. Have we ever afflicted ourselves? Maybe sometimes we think that uh, the affliction of the soul in the day of atonement is only upon our sins. No, it is because of the sins of our relatives, our family members, our spouses, our children. Be like a job. In Job, we are told that Job brought a sacrifice before the Lord saying, peradventure, my sons have cast the Lord in their daily routine. And he brought a sacrifice. When did we ever bring a sacrifice before the Lord, a trespass offering? Not because we have sinned, but we think that our spouses have done anything wrong. Our children have done anything wrong. How can we claim that we are the last generation and we are part of the 144, when actually we are told that Job is a type of the 144. And when we look at the things that Job did, we find none being done amongst us. When we look at what Daniel did in Daniel chapter 9, we do not find ourselves amongst us. Remember how Daniel fainted when he was told unto 2,300 days and the sanctuary shall be cleansed. Daniel had known from the prophets of Jeremiah that after 70 years, the children of Israel are going back to Israel to build the temple to restore their theocracy and uh, the, the system, the sacrificial system, and offer offering unto the Lord. And then he sees uh, the angel Gabriel comes unto him and he tells them, no, 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 unto 2,300 days, then the sanctuary shall be cleansed. When the man of God heard that and he fainted because he never imagined that uh, God could punish his children uh, more than what he had read in Jeremiah. Do we see ourselves? The Lord could have come a long time ago. Maybe your name has passed in the records of heaven and you have already 
pass judgment and you are part of the sins. But do you know the Lord is waiting for you to mourn for somebody else so that also they may get the seal of God and be approved for heaven? The last generation, they mourn before God to see religion despised. In the very homes of those who have had great life, they lament and afflict their souls because pride, avarice, selfishness, and deception, almost every kind of sin is brought into the church. In fact, when you read Revelation chapter 18, and uh, we can just quickly go there and see what is happening in the church, Revelation chapter 18, what is happening? that, um, and he cried mightily with a strong voice saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, and it's become the habitation of the devils and the hold of every false spirit and a cage of every unclean and hateful But As we see the church in such a condition, do we mourn that those who are in this state of confusion may come out? Maybe we are so secure that there is nothing that can be pointed unto us. That is why we do not feel the burden of the work before us. This class, uh, uh, and, and uh, this one is coming from Testimony to the Church, Volume 5, page 209. I'd like to project this. The class who do not feel grieved over their own spiritual declination, nor mourn over the sins of others, will be left without the seal of God. So you thought that uh, it is just a selfish matter. I thought that it is uh, an individual work to get myself to heaven. Now, what brought Satan down here? It is selfishness. And selfishness is the root of every evil. And so if we sit here tonight as a people who are to be counted as the last generation, and only the burden we feel is making ourselves right so that we may get a, a ticket in heaven, then the testimony says we shall be left without the seal of God. We must grieve not only for our own spiritual declination, but also mourn over the sins of others, lest also we miss the seal of God. We are looking at our allegiance, and even I have not come to that, I'm just looking at the experience of the last generation before we look at our allegiance, and then uh, the Lord will bless us. We close this series. In the time of the sifting, soon to take place, we shall be better able to measure the strength of Israel, not only the individuals, but also the corporate church if they are fulfilling their mission. And even though that everyone is charged individually. If we do not take up the task of Isaiah 58 verses one, then we shall not be accomplishing the will of God upon our life. And what does uh, the book of uh, uh, Isaiah 58 verse one say? The book of uh, Isaiah 58 verse one. We are told, cry aloud, spare not, lift up thy voice like a trumpet, and show my people their transgression and the house of Jacob their sins. This is the work, the, the work that the Lord is calling us to do as the last generation. And he says in Ezekiel chapter 33, I have set you as a watchman on Zion's wall. Son of man. Speak to the children of thy people and say unto them, when I bring the sword upon a land, if the people of the land take a man of their coast and set him for their watchman, if when he seeth the sword come upon the land, he blow the trumpet and warn the people, then whosoever heareth the sound of the trumpet and taketh not warning, if the sword come and take him away, his blood shall be upon his own head. He heard the sound of the trumpet and took not warning, his blood shall be upon him, but he that taketh a warning shall deliver his soul. Then he says, but if the watchman on Zion's wall see the word, the sword and blow not the trumpet, and the people be not warned, if the sword come and take any person from among them, he is taken away in his iniquity, but his blood will I require at the watchman's hand. And so we are looking at the selfishness that exists in me, in us and say, okay, no problem. The Lord said, I should go to the country. I have gone. The Lord said, I should have true education. I have it. The Lord said, I should be a 
medical missionary. I am a medical missionary and I have fulfilled everything the Lord wants. And then you be like that rich young fool and say, I have everything. I'll take down my bands, build new ones and store everything there and rest my soul. And then that night the Lord says, you foolish man, your soul is needed in heaven today. And for what good? Not for any good, but for eternal loss. We don't have to come in judgment as the last generation and be found like uh, the rich young fool who thought of himself and what he had achieved and didn't feel the woes of others. None but those who are overcoming by the blood of the lamb and by the word of the testimony and imitating the example of Jesus Christ who was God in nature but did not think to grasp upon the Godhood was something emptied himself and came as a servant without anything for you and for me. We are told there is no greater sacrifice that a man died for his friends. And so also we should die for others. If, you know, we are told in Philippians chapter two, let this mind that was in Christ be in you. And we don't go deeply into that. Even though Christ had everything, the context of Philippians chapter two, he emptied himself and heaven itself was at risk. Heaven itself was imperiled because the man who knew no sin comes to mingle with sins for sin to save them from sin. But then we are told, let this man that was in Christ be in you. And we say, okay. And we think that the mind of Christ is in us, but at the end of the day, we find that we are wounded in the balances of the sanctuary. Can we be able in all executing these messages that the Lord has told us to execute, not look at ourselves and our salvation, but look unto the salvation of others, the last generation. And even though at the end, the test comes to us individually, actually, the church in the sight of God is the theater of his grace and everyone must display that grace to others if he has received that grace. In, uh, in, um, in Christ's object lesson, I presume page 415, paragraph 5. Look at this, Christ object lesson, COL 415, paragraph 5. We are told those who wait for the bridegroom's coming are to say to the people, not to themselves, behold your God. The last race of merciful light, the last message of mercy to be given to the world is a revelation of his character of love. The children of God are to manifest his glory in their own life and character. They are to reveal what the grace of God has done for them. The light of the sun of righteousness is to shine forth in good works, in words of truth and deeds of holiness. Now, when you look at the book of Revelation chapter 18, very keenly, the fourth angel's message is a twofold message. We see the glory of God coming from heaven and really spreading over the four corners of the world. And that is the revelation of the message. It is not the proclamation of the message. It is only after the revelation of the message that the proclamation follows. The glory of God covers the whole earth through his children who have been saved. They manifest what the grace of God has done to, in them. And when they manifest that, then they can go in verse 4 and say, Babylon is fallen, is fallen. Come out of her, my people. You will never tell people to come out. You will never proclaim the message if you have not manifested the message. The problem we are having right now, everyone wants to proclaim the fourth angel's message. No one wants to reflect the image, the, the, the message of uh, Revelation 18. And so we shall continue saying Christ is coming, Christ is coming be able even to detect what the Pope is doing here and there, be able to know what is happening in Middle East, be able to preach about the financial crisis and be Bible studious Bible students and have all the tools to proclaim this message. We shall proclaim, but we shall be noisy symbols. First of all, the message has to be manifested, revealed, the glory of God has to cover all the world and then we can approach the people and tell them, come, out of her, my people. 
Not until that happens, we are bound to be here for some time. And if the Lord decides to come, he will not find a people who are ready. And so uh, we can see the experience that we have. And then in this uh, last uh, 15 minutes, I want to look at this issue about our first allegiance. To whom shall we give allegiance? As every element and every wind is striving and uh, uh, the nations are having a confederacy to wipe out those who actually uh, reveal the image of God or the character of God we are to show the world one thing, that in all this, in Psalms 103 verse 19, we are told the Lord hath prepared his throne in the heavens and his kingdom ruleth over all. That amidst all these things, we shall recognize that our allegiance is on the ruler of the universe because the governments will suggest this and this and they will bring about the laws. But then we are told in Daniel 4, 17, the most high ruleth in the kingdom of men, and our allegiance has to be with God. Dare you be a Daniel in the coming crisis? That if you read, when we read Daniel chapter 3, and this will happen again, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they are brought before the Lord because they can honor the image of the beast, by the way. And when it comes back again, when the little horn's wound is healed again, and the whole world wanders after it, and they enact laws to really uh, 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 limit the liberty of conscience and the freedom of speech. We have to be like Daniel Shadrach. We have to be like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. In Daniel 3.16, where they told the king, we will not serve thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. And if this God cannot deliver us from you, we still, we will not worship you. We should realize that uh, the kingdoms of this world that the devil is offering some people, are just for a while, but soon they are going to pass away. We are to defy the laws of the country if they are against the laws of Jehovah. In Acts chapter 5, verses 27, this is what we read. Acts 5, 27, now we are on our allegiance, our first allegiance. And when they had brought them, they set them before the council, and the high priest asked them, saying, did not we straightly command you that ye should not teach in this, in this name? And behold, you have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine and intend to bring this man's blood upon us. 29, then Peter and the other apostles answered and said, we ought to obey God rather than men. We ought to obey God rather than men. And this is the position of the last jury standing. Think about this. In Babylon, it was Mishael, Hananiah, and Azariah that were the last Jewry standing. All the children of Israel, the others had caved in. They had responded to the image of the beast. And one commentator says, maybe some not wanting to worship the image, they bow down just to tie the lace of their shoes just to avoid the punishment, we shall never have that happening amongst the 144, the last generation. Either you are for God or you are not for him. There is no middle line where actually you can pretend you are tying the shoes and uh, you are not tying it. We are told that uh, neutrality in a religious crisis is a worst hostility against God unlike any other sin neutrality in time of uh, uh, a religious crisis. I think uh, we should read this because uh, uh, it is uh, one of the things that uh, I love to read. And uh, um, neutrality in a religious crisis. 
um, look at this, 3T to 80.3. What astonishing deception and fearful blindness had like a dark cloud over covered Israel. The blindness and apostasy had not closed up about them suddenly. It had come upon them gradually as they had not heeded the word of reproof and warning which the Lord had said to them because of their pride and sins. And now in the, this fearful crisis, in the presence of the idolatrous priest and the apostate king, they remain neutral. If God abhors one sin above another, of which his people are guilty, it is doing nothing in case of an emergency. Indifference and in neutrality in a religious crisis is regarded of God as a grievous crime and equal to the very worst type of hostility against God. And so we have this last jury in the book of Daniel chapter three standing. And they are being counted or not to worship the image of the beast. When it comes again, the last generation has to stand like these three men. Will you stand or will you pretend that um, you are doing something while actually you are uh, bound down to the image of the beast? There is a duty before us. The call to place all on the altar of service comes to each one. We are all, we are not all asked to serve as Elijah served. We are not asked to serve as Elijah come, but a test shall come to us individually, and the Lord will test us on whose side are we. Will we actually give our allegiance to apostates, or will we give our allegiance to heaven? In uh, Christian service, page 105, we are told one may be called to a ministry in a foreign land, another may be asked to give uh, of his means for the support of gospel work, God accept the offering of each. It is the consecration of the life and all it is interest that is necessary. Those who make this consecration will hear and obey the call of heaven. Now, this comes that um, when the earthly support is cut off, will we use our means to be able to finish up the gospel work? And I think about uh, what uh, Brother Zaduk was uh, posting that uh, uh, we may be like a Nicodemus. Just in the time of crisis when the need is needed, that is when we shall be able to give. When uh, the apostles were suffering a lot in the book of Acts, Nicodemus came with all his wealth. There is nothing to keep to yourself. The, this earth is passing away. Will you hold the richness that the Lord has blessed you to enrich others for your own prosperity. And we are told if we try to keep anything at that time, worms shall be able to get into them. And so God is calling a people like Elijah. When the kings of the earth gather together, remember how the king of Israel and the other kings of all nations looked for Elijah, and even when the king of Israel went to other nations, he told them, swear that Elijah is not in your country. And they swore that uh, allegiance to the king of Israel and said Elijah was not there. And all these kings were looking for Elijah because he was the troubler of the people. When all these kings are looking for us, will we have the spirit of Elijah to remain one? to remain and to be counted upon. And when the false prophets and false of Protestantism are being fed at the table of Jezebel, which is the papacy or the papal power in the end time, will we be able to refuse the delicacies of this world and give our allegiance to God? And so lastly, there have been a people who have stood in the time of trouble in the past, not as this one that is coming. Their stories have been written so that we may learn of them. Such examples are not found in the Bible alone. They are bound in every record of human progress. And we can talk about the, uh, the, the Huguenots. We can talk about Wycliffe. We can talk about Haas, Jerome, Luther, Tendel, Knox, uh, Zindendorf, and Wesley, a multitude who stood and uh, we remember Martin Luther. Is it Martin Luther who says, here I am. 
uh, I stand, I have no other. Will we be able, while others were giving, uh, um, were giving away and uh, embracing popery in those times, we had a people who say they will stand with the reformation. In this time, that is the kind of people that the Lord uh, is looking after, that the Lord is making up a number. In uh, Review and Herald, October 1, 1895, last three slides, we read this. We are not to inquire what is the practice of men or what is the custom of the world. We are not to ask how shall I act in order to have the approval of men or what will the world tolerate. The question of intense interest to every soul is, what hath God said? We are to read his word and obey it, not swerving one jot or tittle from it is requirement, but acting irrespective of human traditions and jurisdiction. And so our work in this time that you're living in is to ask what says this and that? Who's, who, from whom is this information uh, is coming uh, from? And we are uh, to decide in our hearts that if it is from God, I shall obey it. And then we are told this, that uh, in uh, Review and Herald, March 25, 1890, the time is coming when we shall be separated and scattered. And each one of us will have to stand without the privilege of communion with those of like precious faith. And how can you stand unless God is by your side and you know that he is leading and guiding you? Whenever we come to investigate Bible truth, the master of assemblies is with us. The Lord does not leave the ship one moment to be steered by ignorant pilots. We may receive our orders from the captain of our salvation. If this happens today, will I or you be safe if we are separated from the brethren of the same like mind? Will still our allegiance be upon God? I want you to contemplate, contemplate upon this. Pray for me that I meditate upon this. Will I stand and will you stand? We have to come out of this selfishness and pray for those who cannot pray for themselves and actually uh, 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 mourn as Jesus Christ uh, mourned for those who are in sin. And we are told in um, 1SM, 1SM 122, the last thing to read, uh, that um, 1SM 118, I'll go back to 118, paragraph two. In the work for this time, it is not money or talent or learning or eloquence that are needed so much as faith graced with humility. No opposition can prevail against truth presented in faith and humility by workers who willingly bear toil and sacrifice and reproach for the master's sake. We must be co-workers with Christ if we will see our efforts crowned with success. We must weep as he wept for those who will not weep for themselves and plead as he pleaded for those who will not plead for themselves. I pray that that should be my prayer, that should be your prayer, and may the Lord work for us, in us, with us, and use us for the work of this time. Otherwise, the Lord bless you, the Lord keep you, and the Lord continue guiding you in all truth so that he may count on you to be part of his army, the last generation that shall finish up the work. Shall we humble for a word of prayer. Shall we humble this time for the word of prayer? Our Heavenly Father, thank you because what you have just promised is what you will do. All we need is to believe that uh, you are a God who doesn't lie. And surely the word that has gone out of your mouth shall not return without fruits. And so as you prepare your people, prepare us not to serve selves, but to serve others. As Christ even humbled himself and did not think that uh, to be God was something to be grasped, but he came as a servant. So help us, Lord, to be servants too. 
if we will be great, he says that uh, let those who shall be great be servants. And we want to be amongst the servants in Revelation chapter 7 that shall be sealed before the winds blow upon the four corners of the world. Bless thy people. And in this Sabbath, may we have an experience with you and even determined to give our allegiance to you in time of trouble. By thy grace, in the name of thy son, we request all these things. Amen. God bless you all. And uh, may the Lord continue keeping you at uh, his feet. Thank you so much.